Hi, this is Mike Ward. I want to talk to you about the terminal growth rate. Now, you will know that one of the main methods of valuing companies is the discounted cash flow method. The basic idea is that although there are machines and buildings and other assets in a business which the accountants keep track of, uh, they use re they, they tend to use things like historical value to value these assets and are conservative in their estimates. But shareholders know that it's not the assets themselves that are worth anything. It's the future cash flows which will come out of these assets in, in time. And so we, what we like to do is estimate what we call the near term, the cash flows in year one, year two, and so on. Uh, and we'll go as far as necessary for a particular industry here, and that may be five years, it may, it may be ten or more, if we can get good, accurate estimates of what we think they're likely to be. And then we discount these uh, by one plus whack and so on into the future to bring them back to a present value. Now, the key issue here is, what about the long-term future? Companies are going to last more than the near term, the five years or 10 or even 15 that we plug in here. And so the terminal value calculation here can be a very important part of this equation. Mathematically, we take the, the, the cash flow in the last year, in my case, year five, and we grow this by a constant growth rate, which we call G, and we discount this by WAC minus G. This gives us the value of the perpetuity, a lump sum value of the perpetuity in year five for the years year six into the into infinity if you like now we still have to of course discount this back to the present value and that's what we're doing on this term over here now the key issue is what about this g what should it be well it's obvious that uh, it represents in fact the cash flow uh, growth the growth of the cash flows, not anything else, not the revenue or anything else, but the cash flow into perpetuity. And it's obvious from this formula here in the denominator that uh, G must be less than WAC. So we need to talk a bit about that as well. Now, just to show you how this would work in Excel, here's a, a project I'm interested in. Here are my free cash flows, and you can see that uh, I'm going to invest a thousand and I'm going to get some cash flows for the first five years, which I'm estimating carefully uh, as I can by perhaps constructing a set of pro forma balance sheet income statements and so on. But it's the, year be it's the years beyond year five. Now, I'm assuming a constant growth rate here of 5%. We'll talk about where we get that from in a minute. And what I'm doing is I am taking this number and discounting it by dividing by WAC, which is 10% minus G over here, which comes to 3780. And uh, I then bring all of this back here, these cash flows back, and uh, you'll see my NPV is in fact 1,903. Now, just to show you what this actually looks like in Excel, you'll see here's my little model here, same data. and. Uh, I wanted to show you this formula first of all, and you can see what I'm doing is I'm taking that cash flow and I'm dividing it by WAC minus the terminal growth rate. You can't see it here, but it's the 5% I've got under here. So that's the one thing. The other is how do you, what does the NPV formula look like? And you, if you look at this, you'll see I'm taking my WAC, that's the discount rate. And notice carefully here what I'm doing. I'm taking C to F. These are the cash flows in year one, two, three, and four, not including year naught. I've got that outside the brackets because that is already in the present value. But in the last part of this here, I am combining that cash flow with that, that cash flow because those are both in year five. This is the actual cash flow in year five, and this is the present value in year five of all the future cash flows growing forever at 5%. Were I to actually calculate this in Excel and just show you what these were right to the end of the spreadsheet, I could have, in fact, just put in this from C2 to, to whatever it is, ZZZ2 all the way across here, and I would get exactly the same answer, in fact. You can try that if you want. Now, let me go back uh, to my PowerPoint over here, 
And uh, I'm just showing you these are the formulas that we're using over here for the perpetuity WAC. The, the, the next cash flow here, in fact, grown uh, and then discounted. And here's my, my WAC formula over here. You can see that portion there where I'm adding that number plus that number here into the NPV. That's just to do the maths. Now, the terminal value can constitute a very large portion of the value of a company. And I'm just showing you some relatively old research here, but these guys talk about the fact that only about 12% of the total share value of Fortune 500 shares could be accounted for by dividends expected over the next five years. Well, they're talking about dividends, we're talking about free cash flows, but it's going to be a similar kind of proportion. These guys are talking about dividends as well of the Dow Jones 30 shares, and they say for a 10-year period, the present value is only re represent of the, of the first 10 years of dividends, uh, and we're talking cash flows, of course, but still constitutes about 43% of the value. So it's not unusual to find the terminal value actually is being estimated as a larger portion of the the value more than 50 percent is going to be after the first five even ten years of the uh, business operations so it's quite important so what should g be this is the key question that we have to grapple with well as i mentioned as g approaches whack the denominator becomes zero and so the terminal value especially if you're using a perpetuity calculation where you're dividing by WAC minus G, approaches infinity. And this can be a problem. Many textbooks will state that G must actually be less than GDP. It sounds logical, but actually if you kind of think hard about this, it may not be true. G measures, as we've said, the constant growth rate of free cash flows into the future. GDP is not a measure of cash flow at all or even of what happens to shares. It is a measure of consumption in the economy, government expenditure, net exports, and so on. You know the formula for GDP. But these are not the same. What the government spends has got nothing to do with what businesses are expected to, end, to earn in the future. Similarly with consumption. These are, these are costs in a way. So if you look at actual data, since 1872, Real, which is, and, and I'm using real here, which means without inflation, simply because GDP is usually measured in real terms here. Real equity returns on, on US shares have been just over 6%, which is way higher than GDP of 2%. So to say that G must be less than, GD, than GDP is clearly a problem. Now, of course, not all shares survive and so that is why we're looking at survivors here these are the ones that keep kept going we did, we're not taking into account the ones that fail and many shares do fail but nevertheless it does suggest to us that maybe uh, uh, two percent or gdp uh, in fact we'd have to make this nominal we need to add inflation here before we put it in so if you thought inflation was going to be say four percent you'd make it six percent here but but then four percent inflation on the real equity returns would take that up to ten percent so what should g be well g should probably be at least expected inflation and we'd normally want to add some measure of extra growth to that as well for most companies perhaps another way of thinking about it though is that WAC minus G, the denominator in the equation, should probably not be less than about 3%. As it starts getting close to zero, it's going to really make that terminal value very big. So another way of thinking about this is by doing a comparison with this perpetuity calculation with an exit multiple. In other words, using the income statement here and seeing what we could sell the company for based on other things. So, for example, if in our company over here we knew that in year five, because we forecast the next five years of income statement to get these cash flows, was going to be, let's say, 430, this is our earnings before interest and tax, our forecast of that, we could go and look and see what is the current ratio between uh, the, um, the, the share price and the earnings, the EBIT per share, 
So it, this is a, a price to earnings ratio, or in fact, to be precise, a price to EBIT ratio. So it's the price of the share divided by the current earnings before interest and tax on that share. Let's say it comes to about 9.5. Then we could use this as a benchmark to get a, a closer sense of this. So 430 times uh, 9.5 would in fact give us about 4,085. And it, it's telling us that we're in the right ballpark. So it's kind of a nice uh, fix on this. Be a little bit careful with this multiple because if you're using not an EBIT multiple but a PE multiple, you must just remember that the price earnings multiple doesn't measure the, the value of the whole business. It just measures the value of the current equity, what the shares are worth. And we would have to add then to this calculation, had we used a PE multiple here, the value of the debt in this company before we compare it to this. So there are a couple of things just to be cautious about here. Well, I hope you found that helpful.